Hi, I'm Daniel Fisher here at Sweetwater, and today we're going to talk about EQ, the most powerful synth tool you're not using. So I get it. It sounds like clickbait. EQ, the most powerful synth tool you're not using. But it really kind of is. And, and the reason is, is that in your synthesizer, you've got filters, you've got your amplifiers, you've got even maybe some of them have EQs, but I promise you they're nowhere near as powerful as the EQ power in these two pedals. And I picked these two pedals for this video for three reasons. And that is one, they're both stereo in, stereo out. And if you have a stereo keyboard, you got to have stereo and stereo out. If you only have a monaural keyboard, only one channel, it can still be important because some of these pedals let you do a separate EQ for the left side and the right side, and you can create really interesting stereo images. And a beauty of creating them that way instead of with delays or anything is that they compress back to mono without any kind of phasing issues. And the third thing that makes these pedals great is that the programs that you've saved can now be called up via MIDI program change, which means for every patch on your synth, you can have a dedicated EQ that will jump to it the exact moment you change to that program. So the first pedal I picked is the Boss EQ 200 graphic equalizer. And the most obvious feature on the front are the 10 sliders for the 10 different frequency bands. Plus there's an 11 slider for your overall gain, plus or minus 15 dB. And from the front panel, you can get to four presets plus a manual mode. And via MIDI, you can get to 128 programs. And there are lots of routing options. You can have mono in, stereo out, stereo in, stereo out. You can have each of the left and right uh, EQs be entirely separate independent devices. You could run them in parallel. You can run them in series. So you could have a, an especially powerful EQ uh, in series. And all of that's settable per preset. So a lot of power there. And you can, like I said, go to your presets via MIDI, but there are lots of other parameters that you can get to via CC numbers. Now, I'm not going to do deep, deep dives on either of these because I am going to make videos on them, but I just want to get an understanding kind of how much power is in this thing. And on this one, when I'm talking about MIDI, I'm talking about the two eighth inch TRS jacks on the side. You can get an optional breakout cable that goes to five pinned in, so you get MIDI in and out through that. And another thing that makes this pedal near and dear to my heart is that it can run on three AA batteries as well as a standard nine volt adapter. The next pedal is the Source Audio EQ2. This is a step up from the original EQ, which was mono, same box, basically the same functions, uh, just more features, and of course it's in stereo, lots more you can do with it. Uh, and again, like this pedal, it has four presets on the front panel, as well as 128 presets that you can get to via MIDI. And this pedal also has a ton of internal features, many of which you can get to from the app, the Source Audio Neuro app uh, that lets you see every parameter and you can get to that via the USB cable. And then of course, each of those can be stored into their locations. There's a tuner in this thing. There's a noise gate in this thing. There's a limiter in this thing. Every one of the EQ bands can be reprogrammed to whatever frequency you want. You can change the width or the Q of each of the bands. You can turn this into a parametric, just tons and tons and tons of features. So just from the surface, this one, uh, you have sliders that you can move in real time quickly. Uh, this pedal is smaller and actually has more features. Um, but their overall job is very similar and their quality levels are both outstanding. And so now to get to the heart of this video, why is EQ the most powerful synth tool you're not using? I base this on reading a lot of forums. Um, it's a sickness, I know. I, I, I just like reading forums about people talking about gear, complaining about gear, and it really helps inform how I do videos and what I show. So I'll see a forum where someone's comparing an old mini Moog to a different mini Moog, and they're saying, yeah, but this one, listen, it has just a little bit more bottom end, or it has just a little more bite, or it just has a little more this or that. Quite often, they're talking about subtle EQ differences that are so subtle, you, re you almost can't tell in a YouTube video which is which. Um, my point, though, is that for the price of one of these pedals, you can make any mini Moog kind of sound like any other mini Moog. And I know it's a generalization, don't yell at me. But, you know, guitar pedals, people will say, oh, this 60s version of that pedal, it has just a little more bottom end, or it has just a little more this, or it has... And on those pedals where you can't adjust the EQ, 
then if that difference is important to you, then sure, you gotta get the more expensive one, you know? And people will pay $300 for a pedal that's only $90 because this is an old one and it has that certain something. Well, that certain something often is EQ. So an investment in EQ can make many of your pedals, many of your uh, keyboards, and even your amplifiers, you know? It can make them be more like the way you want. And I tell you, once you get used to having the power of a good EQ, you're gonna find you never want to be without it. But our primary focus on this video is on synthesis and EQ for synthesis. So let's talk a little bit about uh, when you're creating sounds on a synthesizer, especially uh, a, an analog synthesizer, kind of an old school basic synth, you often have a low pass filter, which means that your lows stay, but your highs get cut. And as you move what's called the frequency center or frequency cutoff, you're changing where you start cutting those high frequencies. The thing with that kind of filter is it's one shape. In other words, it's like you're taking a big wet blanket and you're putting it over the synth and then taking it back off. There's no frequencies where, you know, you're cutting frequencies in the middle, but then there's more up top, or there's some here, but none here, and some here, and none here, and a lot here. Um, and that's a very, very different sound and impossible to get with a single low pass filter or a high pass filter or a band pass filter. I mean, a uh, high pass filter, we can just have a bunch of highs and no lows. A band pass filter, we can pick where we want a frequencies boosted and everything else is relatively low. Or we can do a low pass and cut the highs. But that is a certain sound and we love that sound, but the ability to just have random frequency bands boost or cut on a whim, that's the kind of thing you just can't do with a basic filter. And even on a digital synth that has complex filters, it would be very, very hard to get a filter to do some random EQ shape that you make on a 10 band graphic equalizer. And both of these EQs go very low. They're down to 30 hertz, 31 hertz. And this one will go as high, uh, depending on the setting, you can go up to 16 kilohertz and this can go up to 16 kilohertz. I'm gonna show you on a, monophonic synth, a one note synth, uh, what happens if I take, for example, an arpeggiation and start playing with the EQ and how different that sounds from a filter. So I'm gonna start with the Moog Subsequent 37. It's an analog synthesizer, monophonic, plays one note at a time, and it has one filter. And it is a low pass filter, it's the Moog Ladder filter, it just sounds beautiful. And I can change the curve on it somewhat, you know, with a one pole, two pole, three pole, four pole filter, but it's still this shape, you know, regardless of what the angle is. And that sounds like this. I'm gonna start from low and open it up. I just have a single sawtooth oscillator. And I can use all kind of LFOs and envelopes to move that. And I can add resonance, which is feedback to the filter, which emphasizes the frequency where the cutoff is. But there's a certain sameness to all of those choices. You, it's because I'm kind of just moving the high end levels, you know, up or down and at a specific point and I'm moving that point. But now I'm gonna use the Boss EQ200 and leave the filter wide open, but start changing the EQ and listen to how many variations I can come up with. And I'm gonna use a, a source audio collider to add some reverb and delay in a little bit because I want you to hear the EQ changes moving through a reverb, through a delay. Uh, and that's important because otherwise it's just moving one time. But when you go into a delay, all those motions become like kind of a, a cloud of shapes that you're moving. And that's where this stuff gets really powerful. So let's kick in an arpeggiation.
So the point of that is that there's no way you're getting those kind of sounds out of a single low pass filter. Now we'll do the same thing with the Source Audio EQ2. So that was some examples of a monophonic monaural synth going into these two pedals. Now we'll try a polyphonic synthesizer uh, in stereo. This is the Korg Wave State Wave Sequencing Synthesizer. So we'll start with the Boss EQ200, now in stereo in, stereo out. And now the Source Audio EQ2, programmable EQ. So hopefully that'll get you started on using EQ pedals with your synthesizers. I've also written a companion article, the link is below if you want to read it. If you have any further questions on EQ pedals, please contact your Sweetwater sales engineer. My name is Daniel Fisher, thank you very much for watching. Thanks for watching and be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. To learn more, go to sweetwater.com for all your music instrument and pro audio needs.